In the dimming twilight of the 15th century, amidst the murmurs of the Atlantic's untold stories, a mariner's destiny unfolded in the vast expanse of the unknown. Vasco da Gama, scion of Portugal, embarked on a maritime odyssey that wove a tapestry of conquest and discovery across uncharted oceans. Like a ship's prow cutting through ocean spray, his life carved a path through history, leaving an indelible mark on the annals of exploration. Born into the maritime embrace of Sinesh, Portugal, in the early 1460s, Vasco da Gama was baptized in the salt and spray of the Atlantic. The Gama lineage, deeply connected to the sea, infused young Vasco with the maritime spirit. Raised in the shadow of his esteemed father, Istevao da Gama, a nobleman, the young navigator imbibed the longing for horizons that lay beyond the cobbled streets of Sinesh. In 1492, King John II of Portugal dispatched Vasco to Setubal and the Algarve, tasking him with capturing French ships that had preyed on Portuguese shipping during peacetime. A mission executed with remarkable speed and efficiency. The early 15th century saw Portugal, driven by Prince Henry the Navigator, aspiring to chart a sea route to India, circumventing Africa's southern tip and challenging Venetian trade dominance. Bartolomeo Diaz's explorations and confirmation of an unknown coastline fueled these ambitions. Concurrently, land expeditions hinted at the possibility of reaching India by sea, with Pedro da Covilha and Alfonso de Paiva's journey to Alexandria adding substantial weight to this notion. In the intricate dance of history, Vasco da Gama's father was initially tasked with bridging the gap between Diaz's findings and land explorations, but died ahead of the enterprise. Entrusted by King Manuel I in 1497, Vasco assumed command of the expedition. His prior success in protecting Portuguese interests along the African Gold Coast influenced this decision. Financed by the Florentine banker Girolamo Cernige, the expedition, known as the First Army of India, marked the commencement of Vasco's historic journey to open a sea route to the Indian Ocean, challenging the hegemony of Mediterranean trade routes. King Manuel I anointed Vasco da Gama with the mantle of Captain Major, entrusting him with the helm of a majestic fleet bound for the enigmatic shores of India. This expedition, a symphony of exploration, sought not just to chart new routes, but to dismantle the Venetian dominion that had long cast shadows over maritime commerce. Casting off from Belém on the resonant day of the 8th of July, the fleet, a quartet of seafaring titans, São Gabriel dancing with the winds under Vasco's command, São Rafael pirouetting gracefully led by brother Paulo, Berrio pirating the waves helmed by Nicolau Coelho, and the steady São Miguel ferrying essential sustenance under the watch of Gonzalo Nunes, embarked on a maritime odyssey laden with missives, banners, and the echoes of past voyages, eager for a rendezvous with the realms of the unknown. With limited knowledge of the advanced cultures of India, the fleet departed with Portuguese trading stock that would have little value in the east. Guided by the spectral presence of Bartolomeu Dias, the expedition traced the sinuous contours of the African coast, a choreography unfolding through Tenerife's flamenco and the rhythmic beats of the Cape Verdean archipelago. Navigating the equatorial divide, Vasco orchestrated the maritime ballet, executing the sublime back-from-the-sea maneuver that had been etched in the maritime chronicles by Bartolomeo Diaz in 1487. By the 4th of November 1497, the fleet, a celestial armada, reconnected with the African shore, having pirouetted past the Great Fish River on the southern coast of Africa. Embarking upon aqueous canvases uncharted, the intrepid voyagers, guided by the indomitable spirit of exploration, bestowed upon the newly discovered coastline the moniker Christmas on the 25th of December, now part of modern-day KwaZulu-Natal province. Yet the maritime odyssey was no serenade to tranquility. Battling tempests and a marine uprising, the expeditionary force graced the Mozambican shores on the second day of March in the subsequent year, 1498. In this seaborne saga, 
the narrative assumes a dramatic tenor, marked by encounters with the realms under the sway of Islam. Initially, the interactions were characterized by a veneer of harmony, a delicate dance between disparate cultures seeking common ground. The local sultan, acknowledging the magnitude of Vasco da Gama's mission, extended the gesture of cooperation, supplying the Portuguese explorer with a seasoned pilot. This guide, entrusted with the crucial task of navigating the fleet toward the coveted shores of India, carried with him the weight of destiny. Yet, within the intricate tapestry of maritime diplomacy, threads of treachery began to unravel the fragile accord. A disconcerting revelation unfolded. The very pilot, ostensibly an ally in the grand maritime enterprise, had clandestinely received instructions to orchestrate a nefarious trap at Mombasa. The currents of communication, once seemingly smooth, broke down in a tumultuous collision of conflicting interests with the fleet, making a hasty departure, accompanied by the roar of cannon fire. In the lyrical landscapes of Kenya, the expedition plundered the treasures of undefended Arab merchant ships. This crescendo, marking their inaugural European arrival on Mombasa's theatrical stage, was met with an overture of hostility. Leaving Mombasa behind, the fleet arrived at the competing kingdom of Malindi, where they were warmly welcomed and bestowed with the services of an experienced and loyal pilot to guide them across the Indian Ocean. On the auspicious day of the 20th of May, 1498, the fleet unfurled its sails and found anchor at Kapakadavu, nestled near Calicut in the realm of present-day Kerala, India. This marked the triumphant culmination of the African Odyssey, with the establishment of the Cape Route and the unveiling of a sea passage that seamlessly connected Europe to the fertile shores of India. In the wake of their arrival, a Jewish-Christian convert in Vasco's employ, freshly disembarked and possessing rudimentary knowledge of Arabic, was dispatched to make the initial contact with the enigmatic land of Calicut. Greeted by two Moors of Tunisian origin, the dialogue unfolded in Spanish, with one of them posing a terse query, To the devil I give you, who brought you here? His response has echoed through the annals of history. We have come to look for Christians and spices. A peculiar misunderstanding pervaded the perception of the indigenous Hindu gods, as Vasco and his crew initially perceived them as Christian saints, a stark contrast to the imageless deities of Islam. This intriguing belief in the Christians of India endured for a considerable period, lingering as a cultural artifact even upon their return. However, the diplomatic endeavors of Vasco encountered formidable challenges in negotiating with the formidable ruler of the Hindu state of Calicut, the Zamorin. Despite the aspirations to secure favorable commercial conditions, the meager value of Portuguese commodities proved stumbling blocks. The representatives of the Zamorin derided the offerings, while established Arab merchants vehemently resisted the prospect of unwelcome competition. The Portuguese goods, lacking the allure of the high-value trades practiced by others, failed to elicit trust. In a strategic maneuver, faced with the impasse, the Portuguese reluctantly sold their commodities at a diminished price, a tactical compromise to procure modest quantities of spices and jewelry. This maneuver, born out of necessity, marked the pragmatic approach of Vasco da Gama's expedition in navigating the intricate dance of commerce in this foreign land. Ultimately, the Zamorin expressed satisfaction with the missives from King Manuel I of Portugal, and Vasco da Gama secured an ambiguous letter granting trading rights, much to the annoyance of the established Muslim traders. Yet, the sands of diplomacy shifted sharply again, as the leadership acquiesced to the advice of the head of the Calicot naval forces to securitize the entirety of the Portuguese assets. Unwilling to surrender his holdings, Vasco began to prepare to leave Calicot. He would leave behind a small group of his men to establish a permanent trading post of offices and warehouse facilities. In the sweltering heat of August 1498, the fleet embarked on the homeward journey from India to Portugal. In his eagerness to depart, he ignored the advice of the local mariners regarding the monsoon patterns and set sail in defiance of the prevailing winds. 
While the initial traverse of the Indian Ocean to India had required a mere 23 days, the arduous return voyage spanned a staggering four and a half months. The vessels, weather-beaten and worn, found solace in the sheltering arms of Malindi, arriving on the seventh day of January in the year 1499. Scurvy, a silent reaper, exacted a heavy toll, claiming half the surviving crew, a mere 55 souls of the original 148 men that set forth on the maritime venture, returned to the embrace of Portugal. The Caravel Berrio, a nimble sprite amidst the fleet, emerged as the vanguard, gracing Lisbon's shores on the 10th day of July in 1499 under the seasoned command of Nicolau Coelho. For Vasco da Gama, the return to Portugal in September 1499 bore the weight of melancholy, shadowed by the demise of his elder brother Paulo in the Azores. He returned, however, with a cargo bounty worth 60 times the cost of the voyage. Acknowledged as the architect of an eight-decade-long plan, Vasco was anointed with the august title Admiral of the Seas of India and bestowed with vast tribute and hereditary pensions and titles. The perpetual honorific of Dom, coupled with the gift of two villages, were the royal tokens of gratitude extended not just to Vasco, but to his brothers as well. The return, marked by sorrow and triumph, crystallized the denouement of a historic odyssey, etching Vasco da Gama's name indelibly into the annals of Portuguese exploration. In the wake of these maritime exploits, Portugal, fortified by its military and technological ascendancy, sought to wield its supremacy strategically along the coveted routes to India. The grand design envisaged nothing short of a trading hegemony not only in the Indian subcontinent, but also in the maritime passages connecting Portugal to this lucrative eastern domain. Following Vasco da Gama's triumphant return to Portugal, the baton of maritime ambition passed to Pedro Álvarez Cabral. Embarking on his expedition to India, Cabral, en route, incidentally bestowed the shores of Brazil with the imprint of European arrival in 1500. The primary objective was clear to engage in the lucrative commerce of pepper and assorted spices. Negotiating and establishing a factory at Calicut, Cabral's sojourn took an unforeseen turn when the Portuguese enclave faced an unforeseen assault by irate locals. The conflagration resulted in the tragic demise of over 50 Portuguese souls. Enraged by this affront, Cabral unleashed a retaliatory maelstrom, seizing Arab merchant vessels, meeting out a ruthless toll on their crew and consigning their cargo to the flames. The reprisal extended to a merciless bombardment of Calicut, a fiery testament to the violation of agreements. However, amidst the tumult, Cabral navigated diplomatic successes, securing advantageous treaties with local potentates in Cochin and Cananor. Laden with the spoils of gold, silk and exotic spices, Cabral set sail on the return voyage, a voyage marked by adversity. Only four of the original 13 ships would navigate the treacherous seas back to Portugal by the 23rd of June, 1501. In 1501, João de Nova undertook the third Portuguese expedition, its aims echoing the pursuit of spices and European return. Serendipitously, the fleet encountered the hitherto unknown islands of Ascension and St. Helena in the South Atlantic. The venture, initially conceived as a commercial foray, found itself embroiled in the First Battle of Cananor, off the Malabar coast, a clash with the vessels of the Zamorin of Calicut, marking the inaugural naval confrontation of the Portuguese in India. The year 1502 witnessed Vasco da Gama's return to the Indian shores, this time commanding a formidable armada of 15 ships and 800 men. The diplomatic overtures took a bellicose turn when Gama, rebuffed in his call to expel Muslims from Calicut, resorted to bombardment and capture, driven by intelligence that the Zamorin was rallying neighboring rulers against the Portuguese incursion. Gama's expedition extended beyond Calicut, with the reduction of Baticala to tributary status, the establishment of a trade treaty and post at Cananor, and a decisive naval engagement with the Zamorin's fleet at the Battle of Calicut in 1503. In this turbulent era of Portuguese maritime ascendance, 
the quest for dominance and prosperity in the eastern trade routes unfolded in a symphony of diplomatic finesse, military might, and commercial acumen. In 1503, as Vasco da Gama laid the cornerstone of the Portuguese enclave in Cochin, he etched the final verses of his maritime epic. September of that year saw him retracing the watery pathways back to Portugal, where, amid the shower of royal accolades, the resonance of retirement echoed louder. By 1513, the curtain descended on Gama's maritime odyssey as he withdrew to Evora, the culmination of a career that traversed the gamut of exploration, diplomacy, and conquest. In the annals of 1519, a singular accolade awaited Vasco, a coronation as the inaugural Count of Vidigueira, an honor bestowed not through the hereditary conduits of royal blood, but through a strategic gambit with the Duke of Braganza. This unprecedented title, conferred upon him by Manuel I, came bundled with the quaint villages of Vidigueira and Vila de Frades, their attendant incomes, and a tapestry of privileges that painted a narrative of distinction hitherto unseen. Between 1503 and the 1520s, Portugal fortified its positions along the African coast and in India, initiated upon the appointment of the first Portuguese Viceroy of India in 1505. Recognized as a sagacious troubleshooter amidst the complexities of Indian affairs, Vasco returned to the subcontinent in 1524, tasked with supplanting the incumbent, incompetent Viceroy, Duarte de Menezes. Yet, the oppressive embrace of Goa's humidity carried with it the insidious touch of malaria, ensnaring the venerable mariner in its fevered clutches. Despite the affliction, his viceroy tenure bore the imprint of unwavering governance, a quest to instill order amid the nuanced tapestry of Indian affairs. However, the winds of fate took an inexorable turn, and on Christmas Eve, December 24, 1524, Vasco da Gama breathed his last in the city of Cochin. The mantle of history, woven from the threads of Vasco's exploits, bore imprints of conquest and cultural encounter. His legacy, akin to the wake of a ship on the ocean's surface, rippled through the currents of time. Vasco da Gama, the daring navigator who dared to chart the unknown, left behind a legacy transcending the confines of geography. His voyages, emblematic of the age of exploration, thrust Portugal onto the global stage, inscribing the narrative of Vasco da Gama in the storied pages of maritime lore.